Welcome to Scandal Water, where the tea is hot and the conversation lively. Your hosts, Candy and Ashley, will discuss a peculiar story somehow related to the entertainment industry. This podcast might not change the world, but it just might satisfy your thirst for an intriguing tale. Oh, it's that time of day. Tune in and hear what the ladies say. It's time to bend your ear when the silver screen appears. Stories about the stage and screen and everything in between. So come on and join the fun. The curtain opens in three, two, one. Happy Halloween, Ashley. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Thought we'd start with a little fun music to get us going. Yes. And yeah, I noticed weird. that you have a shirt on to celebrate as well. I do. This is my annual Halloween shirt. I put it on only, obviously, for this holiday, but I always like pulling it out. I've got all the little pumpkins going. It's very festive. You dress for it as well. I did. I saw what you had on and I decided to go for my kitty cat and the moon and a spider. That's my Halloween shirt, if you will. I love I love the Halloween season. It's so fun. And I'm excited about this episode because we did something different. Yes, we did. And we're recording it a little bit different too, because usually you're at my house and we're recording in the library. But but because we're going to bring in some visuals, Mm -hmm. we decided we were going to make this kind of interview format so that we could share some of our photos and possibly even little videos Mm -hmm. with our listeners. So we're definitely going to be obviously putting this on YouTube as well as the audio version. And we would encourage you to check it out on our YouTube channel if you um, are interested. All right. Well, jumping in. Here's what we did, guys. For our Spooktober theme, we thought, why not take this idea? We've been playing a little bit with some, you know, trying to do some field trips. So we thought, why not bring in some graveside visits, which Mm -hmm. sounds odd probably to some people, but honestly, it's a big thing. I did a little research about cemetery. They called it cemetery tourism. And then A 2021 article, it made this statement, cemetery tourism is a growing market with its very own beauty and interesting aspects. It talks about how many people will pay to go tour cemeteries. I know Kirk and I, and and I think you did as well. We we went to Bonaventure, I remember, Mm -hmm. and there was a tour. And because we couldn't get into the tour, they had an app that we could download that took us self-guided that probably would have helped us a whole lot. We, we just, use, <laughs> we, we just, Brian and I just used this little, this little guy and it was that. So we went at an old school. We printed it like we were pirates looking for treasure. Oh, well, yes. This little app was put out by, I want to say, I have it in my notes here somewhere, but I believe it was their historical society. Okay. And it was amazing because they just said, drive to your right. No. Look, stop at this landmark, look to your left or what, you know, it was, yeah. That would have been but, valuable information, <laughs> <laughs> but it was but fun. It, I really had a fun time. But back to the point, it's big business. Recent U.S. news travel article listed New Orleans cemetery tours as number six on their list of the top things to do in New Orleans. This it's a, it's an industry. It's something that people do as tourists, mm-hmm. um, when they visit new places, it's something that people do just in their own hometowns, because there are several reasons that these different articles talked about for people going there. Mm -hmm. Everything from history, going there because there might be somebody famous there or some of their own relatives, maybe historical events are kind of commemorated there. For example, there's a Confederate cemetery located in a town near me. So, you know, there are different historical reasons people will go. They talk about some people go just for the beauty of the location that so many of them are like memorial gardens and they're just gorgeous and they have architecture and all these different things that people enjoy. So they'll go there just to relax and to find peace. In fact, when Kirk and I went to find one of the, our grave sites, there was a group of three ladies who were just walking there. Like they had just chosen that as their walking site. Right. Right. They are very peaceful places or they can be. And then of course, I think this is the one that probably came to some people's mind first the spooky aspect to graveyards kirk and i like to go on a lot of ghost tours and many many times there will be a stop in a graveyard Mm -mm. so is it near dark is it dark when you do that of course no 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 no. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's not something you'd be no nope, for. nope 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 i don't know who comes out at night those places no they can i will stay in my spot they stay in their spot that's fine <laughs> when it's yeah. dark i leave it's yours <laughs> Well, I, I do think they're fascinating. I think yeah. cemeteries are, are just fascinating places. Mm-hmm. And so I was really excited when we came up with this idea. Yeah, well, I got to say it, it is it is your brainchild. And I, I thought it was fascinating. And when we knew that I had another opportunity to go to Savannah, we were like, hey, why don't I cover Bonaventure? And I realized once I got there, and I'm telling you this now, because I'm so, I'm so kind of embarrassed. I have not done this. It's just you know, if you walk through a graveyard, it would be for family or something. I don't remember a time where I've just gone to, well, of course I haven't done it for a podcast, but to go to say, here, look at what I saw, you know what I'm saying? So I mm-hmm. came at it and I was like, I feel very respectful of these people. So I wore a black dress. I was like, how do I dress for this? And I wore a black sundress. Cause I thought I want to look respectful. I don't want to make this look like it's for like fun or anything. And then when I was taking pictures of the ones that I'm going to show you, it dawned on me that I need to have a picture with them to prove that I didn't just Google this Mm. off the internet and it really is my photograph. So I had Brian take my picture in front of the graves and I didn't want to smile because I didn't want to look disrespectful. So I did my best respectful face and I just looked miserable. So <laughs> so me trying to look and do a very respectful stance for these people, it looks like I'm in misery and I wasn't. It was very hot, but I just want to say up front, I, I look ridiculous. It's it may look very weird. period because if you were in Bonaventure, it may, you know, back in the 1800s or the no, people it's didn't a smile in their photograph. <laughs> and they weren't wearing sunglasses and sandals though. So I think you make an excellent point. I'm glad you said that because yeah. I felt the same way. We we did not come at this from an angle of mm-hmm. being disrespectful or no. sensational. It wasn't anything like that. We we knew it was this is a this is a form of the entertainment industry. Yeah. It is. It, it's something that people do at the same time we were thinking about who are some people who contributed to the entertainment industry. We tried to think of some people to visit their grave sites so that we could honor what they had contributed to the entertainment industry. I did the same thing. Uh, You're going to see that I was in a black dress for most of my photos, but then my last site that I went to was kind of spur Spur of the the moment moment. Mm -hmm. and I'm not dressed as appropriately for that one. But I had the same idea because we, we definitely wanted to come at this from a respectful angle. We tried not to let each other know what we were up to we knew we were safe because she was going to be in savannah Mm -hmm. and i was going to be more regional Mm -hmm. so we felt confident we weren't going to overlap but we're going to be a bit surprised we hope by each other's locations or or visit well i'll start how about that so living near louisville kentucky Mm -hmm. it occurred to me that i had never been to the gravesite of one of the most famous and beloved louisville residents ever muhammad ali okay i didn't know if you're gonna go for mr sanders or mr ali yeah muhammad ali so I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Guys, you all know books written about this man. Mm -hmm. I am just going to be surface level hitting a few highlights. I apologize for what I miss because this is that word beloved, I think is so appropriate here. I know that he is still in so many people's hearts. So I want to, I want to say that up, up front, but just to kind of touch on a few things about Muhammad Ali, he was actually born Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. on January 17th, 1942 in Louisville. His parents were Odessa, Odessa and Cassius Marcellus Sr. He had one brother. Now they grew up, he grew up most of his years at 3302 Grand Avenue in Hmm. downtown Louisville. And that childhood home is now a museum that you can tour if you are interested. Okay. And he attended Central High School on Chestnut Street and graduated in 1960. He came into boxing in a very unusual way. I'd never heard the story. I don't know if you had, Ashley. But when he was 12, his bike was stolen. And he was really angry, as you can imagine. And so the police officer who was talking to him about this incident, a man named Joe Martin, was sympathizing with him. And Clay said, Cassius Clay said, he wanted to beat up the thief. And so reportedly, this police officer, Joe Martin, said, 
said, quote, well, you better learn how to fight before you start challenging people. So it turns out that not only was Joe Martin a police officer, but in his spare time, he would work with young boxers at the local gym and he took him under his wing. He started teaching young Cassius Clay how to box. And not long after that, he was in his very first amateur bout. He was gifted. By the time he was graduating from high school in 1960, he was also that same year becoming an Olympic gold medalist. He was 18. I know, I know. His mom took him to a Baptist church as they were growing up. But in 1964, four years after he graduated from high school and became this Olympic gold medalist, he converted to Islam. And that's at the point where he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Everybody probably knows how charismatic he was. That's what he's known for. He was so confident, almost poetic in the way he would talk. I think Float like a butterfly, knows. sting like a bee. Had you heard the rest of it? The rest of it goes, your hands can't hit what your eyes can't see. Oh, cute. Yeah. That's very so clever. Talking about his boxing style. A 2018 article about the biggest trash talkers in sports history, and they listed Muhammad Ali first. And they gave him a few, they gave him a few of his famous lines. One of them was, if you even dream of beating me, you better wake up and apologize. Oh. <laughs> and then it said in that same article that he would often call himself the best just before he would knock out his opponents. And I think that's another very famous thing was he would refer to himself as the greatest of the all greatest. time. He greatest. did not have a problem with confidence. He did not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it served him well. The thing was, so many of the articles I looked at said he was. He was one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century. I mean, it wasn't just talk. Mm -hmm. In addition to his Olympic gold medal, he was the first fighter to ever win the world heavyweight boxing title three times. Wow. It was in 1964, defeating Sonny Liston, 1974, defeating George Foreman, and 1978, Leon Spinks. Among tons of other wins and awards, he was named Sports Illustrated's Sportsman of the Century in 1999. But what I think is really cool is that beyond being this athlete who changed the world of sports, he's also been applauded for being a huge philanthropist and a social activist. Mm -hmm. And he was known for speaking out against injustice, racial inequality. And a really famous thing was when he took a stand against the Vietnam War. Had you heard about this before? And in my periphery. So what, what did he do? I had no idea. He said that he objected based on his religious mm -hmm. beliefs mm -hmm. and he was called up to fight, mm -hmm. but he refused to be inducted into the U.S. Armed Forces invoking his constitutional right to decline service as a conscientious objector. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And that's actually a criminal act. Oh. So as a result, in March of 1967, they stripped him of his heavyweight title. Oh. He was convicted of draft evasion and sentenced to five years in prison. Did he serve? Now, no, okay. he did not because they were appealing it. Okay. But during the time that he was in appeals, he was basically banned from boxing. He went for oh. something like three and a half years where he couldn't box. He was stripped of his passport. He was unable to obtain a license to box in any state and... Finally, it changed. It ended on June 28, 1971, when the U.S. Supreme Court overturned his conviction for evading the draft. But it was brought up in several different articles that this was a sacrifice. His taking this stand was big because he lost That's some of the most fighting time. Exactly. Yeah. Untold millions mm -hmm. lost. You know, when you're a boxer and, and you're in a sport that takes such a toll on your body, mm -hmm. you're giving up some of your prime young, you know, your health the time, I guess it should mm -hmm. say. In fact, some people speculated that because of what he had sacrificed here, he boxed longer than maybe he should have. And it may have contributed to his, some of his medical conditions and, gotcha. you know, maybe even have pushed him towards the Parkinson's that he developed later in life. That's some speculation, mm -hmm. but here's what Ali was quoted as saying one time. I've always wanted to be more than just a boxer, more than just the three time heavyweight champion. I wanted to use my fame and this face that everyone knows so well to help uplift and inspire inspire people around the world. So when he retired from boxing in 1981, it was only three years later in 1984 that he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And it's around this time that he really amped up his work to serve others and to try to make a difference. Mm -hmm. He supported Parkinson's research. He became active in the Special Olympics and the Make-A-Wish Foundation. In 1990, he helped negotiate the release of 15 American hostages from Iraq. 
1998, he became a United Nations Messenger of Peace for his work overseas. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2005, and it was that same year that they opened the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville, Kentucky, by the way. So he got to see it. He got yes. to see the center open? Yes. Okay, good. So he did so much before he died. I can't hit it all. One other last thing I think a lot of us remember was that in the 1996 Olympics that were held in Atlanta, he was the one Lit the torch. chosen to carry yeah, chosen to carry the torch and light the cauldron to signal the beginning of the games, mm -hmm. which I was remember a that. huge honor. Yeah, I do too. At age 74, on June 3rd, 2016, he passed away of respiratory complications related to his Parkinson's, and he was buried a week later in Cave Hill Cemetery with a hundred thousand people gathering in Louisville to pay their respect. Wow, I did not remember or realize it was that many people. I didn't either. Now, here, here's what also took me by surprise. They said that so many people come to visit his gravesite that if somebody gets in the, gets in an Uber from the airport and just says Muhammad Ali, they know to take them to the cemetery because so many people from around the world come to really? visit his gravesite. Yes, it's amazing. So here's, here's what was really cool. He got to pick out his own space. Mm. Before he passed away, he went to Cave Hill. He got to say, here's where I want to be. Here's what I want it to look like. Wow. And so he wanted it to be a place where people could come and reflect and pay their respects. Mm -hmm. So one of the aspects of his gravesite are some benches. Mm -hmm. He wanted it to be a peaceful place. He wanted it to be beautiful and colorful. So there are all kinds of beautiful flowers. There's this magnolia tree. His area is kind of shaded by this large magnolia tree. There's an inscription on his headstone that reads, service to others is the rent you pay for your room in heaven. Hmm. And inside his casket, he rests on his side facing the east, which is a nod to his devotion to the Islamic faith. Interesting. I didn't know you could do that. One last thing that I'll share is so many people who visit also leave things. So the, for the I first- I noticed that. When we were went and toured, there was a lot of money, nickels and dimes and trinkets and shells left, at least in Savannah. So what did they leave there? It's unbelievable what they leave there. Yeah. For the first five years, the people who ran the cemetery didn't throw the things away. Every mm. token that was left- they kept it in this little room locked up and had this unbelievable collection of things. So it was actually an article, I think, in the Courier Journal where they brought in this reporter and sat down with some of the cemetery staff and they went through items and talked about all the different things. But it was everything from cards and letters to elephants, which they think might have been a nod to the 1974 rumble in the jungle bout um, that was so famous. Okay. They have coins. There was a large wooden train once, like a, the size of a bread box, they said. This piece of a train that was left one time. Mm. So one time somebody left a full-size rocking chair. Like they said it is unbelievable, all the things that have been left there. But I, I thought I would end with these two notes that were in that same article I just referenced. One of them said, rest in peace to the greatest ever. Mm. Your courage, energy, compassion, and pretty face inspired millions. Hmm. And the other one said, champs die, but legends live. And then that was with a huge number of photos of Muhammad Ali that were with that note. That's very cool. It was beautiful. And, and when Kirk and I were there, just five to 10 minutes, we had to wait for a carload of people to leave before I could mm. very respectfully, as you said, take the pictures to show that I was there. Right. And to give you a sense of how it was laid out as mm -hmm. well, because you couldn't get it all in one picture. The mm. benches were on the sides. And I mean, it was just this beautiful arrangement, but I had to wait. We had to wait for one group to leave. And as I started walking up, here came another carload Then two more. I mean, just in the space so of five still... to 10 minutes. It, yes. Wow. Yes. So yeah. I don't have a tie to him, but I have a family tie when my brother, and I don't even know if he remembers this, but when my brother was about a year or two old, 1987, 88, Muhammad Ali was dining at a Shoney's and I was in school. So I would have been eight or nine. So I'd have been in school. And my dad, and I don't know if my mom was there or not. I think she was, but my dad and mom were there and they were at the Shoney's and he was eating there. And my dad was like, 
I'm going to take my son to go meet this guy. And I don't remember what transpired, but I do know that he gave my dad and my brother his autograph. And so I have it with my collection and it's on one of the tracks about the Islam religion. So that's all he had with him, but it's dated and it's to my dad's name and to my brother's name. And it's got his autograph on it. That's amazing. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a picture of one of those. I'll make a note in the show notes so everybody can see it. Okay. So that means it is my turn to do my first section correctly. I want to tell it. I want to tell everybody right now that we have chosen the right girl to write all of these episodes because I'm a big baby. I had like two days when we got home, I had Monday and Tuesday to write up my section. It ended up being about all told like 16 pages. And I was whining the whole time. I was like, (laughs) I don't like doing this. I don't like being, having to have sources and having to tell where my knowledge comes from. I just want to be the trivia girl. And I just want my Blah, blah, blah. So I complained to myself this entire time while also respecting you. And I texted Candy at one point. I said, you can't quit. Our podcast is going to cease if you quit. So just everybody oh. know, everybody take a moment to appreciate Candy because she's why we're here. You're so sweet. Oh, well, it's true. <laughs> okay. So I went to, as we said, I had a chance to go back to Savannah and we went to Bonaventure Cemetery. And as I mentioned earlier, we did not know about the app. So we took this little guy and we found it just like it was a, a scavenger hunt. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about the cemetery itself, because that mm-hmm. actually ties into later sections. Yes. Oh, and also I, to all the you folks that say use more than one source, I'm very sorry. I tried. I read more than one source, but then I would pick the one that I like the best because again, I had two days and I'm not candy. So I found <laughs> an article online called 12 Fascinating Things You Didn't Know About Bonaventure Cemetery dated December 2nd, 2021. Item number two on the list tells a bit about the history of the cemetery. It's pretty complicated. In its previous life, it was a plantation owned by Colonel John Mulrine. He named it Bonaventure Plantation, which means good fortune. Hmm. From the article directly, it says, quote, Mulrine's, Mulrine, Mulrine, I'm not sure. His daughter, Mary married Josiah Tatnall Sr. And if you see an aerial shot of the cemetery, you'll even notice that a lot of the oak trees on the plantation were planted in the shape of the letters M and T. Which is that's cool. Yeah, it's kind of cute. By 1771, Mulrine and Tatnall saw good fortune indeed. This is still from the article. As their plantation expanded to over 9,000 acres, comprising most of the Savannah region. This is a big deal. Yeah, it is. But once the American Revolutionary War broke out, they both pledged their loyalties to Great Britain, end quote. So I think when they say Mulrine and Tatnall, they mean Mary's father and husband here. So mm-hmm. these fellows basically helped the royal governor, James Wright, by hiding him at Bonaventure until he could catch a oh. ship back home to England. So as a result, they were seen as loyalists mm-hmm. and traitors, mm-hmm. and they were stripped of all their land. Took <gasps> it away from them. Yeah, they took it away from Oh, them. wow. Everything was sold at auction, and Tatnall hot-footed it to England, while Mary's dad, Mulrine, sailed to the Bahamas, where he died after just a couple of years. So we're going to fast forward to a man named John Habersham. And remember the name Habersham. It's going to okay. come up way later. He bought about 750 of the acres back, which he then sold to Tatnall's son, Josiah Jr., after a few years. So now, back in the family. Back in the family, yeah. Which this Habersham guy, he was also a loyalist, so that's probably why he did it. Mm. And now that at least part of Bonaventure was back with the Tatnalls, they, and I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, they began to use it for family burial plot with the first one going to Josiah Jr.'s wife, Harriet, in 1802. So now we see it being used for a cemetery. Okay. And fast forward 44 more years to 1846 when the plantation and the family cemetery were sold to a guy named Peter Wiltberger. He's now buried there. And in 1868, so about 40 years later, his son converted Bonaventure to a private cemetery that he called Evergreen. So we're not Bonaventure anymore. He called it Evergreen. Okay. But don't memorize that because it changed real quick. In 1907, Evergreen was purchased by the city of Savannah, where they changed the name back to Bonaventure and made it a public cemetery. So now we are where we are. Now, mm-hmm. nobody really cared that much about the cemetery. I mean, it just kind of existed until 
1994 when the novel midnight in the garden of good and evil came out oh here we and, go yep and the 19 <laughs> and in 1997 the film was released and it amped up the popularity even more mm -hmm. so much so that the famous bird girl statue which we're going to circle back to had to be removed because people were trampling over graves to get to her so I the surviving heard. family whose burial plot she was on had to relocated and this is why we can't have nice things guys <laughs> <laughs> So now that we know a bit of the history of the cemetery, let's start with our tour of the graves. And I'm going to jump into these folks. You do not know these folks. I know you don't because I did. So the first people I found, I got to say, I found them because I did a Google search for the most significant grave sites of Bonaventure. And this mm -hmm. woman was listed as a silent film actress. I don't know why they did not list her husband as well, because he was also significant. Her name is Edith Chapman, and his name is James Neal. Have you heard of them? I don't think so. Okay. And Edith spells it really cool. It's E-D-Y-T-H-E. -E. So since I knew we were looking for entertainment connections and I was trying to bring the person you may not have heard of, I figured she's going to fit the bill. So we took a photograph and then I came home and did the research on her and her husband, James. And I am super fascinated by this couple. I had, Ooh. yeah, I had such a quick turnaround for this episode that I wasn't able to do as much as I wanted, but I really want to look into their lives a little deeper later on. I'm definitely going to watch more of their films. So we're going to start with James Neal to keep the timeline of this couple a little smoother. James was born on September 29th, 1860 which is a few months before the start of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. His Wikipedia article is what I mostly relied on, and it's a lot longer than Edith's, but that's also just about the only place I could find info on either one of them. Yeah. James is the one with the ties to Georgia. He graduated from the University of Georgia in 1882 and jumped straight into a career on the stage, which Wikipedia says lasted nearly 50 years. Now, this, 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 James, I don't know anybody else that's done this. Piece of trivia about James. According to that page, he, quote, has appeared on stage in every state in the Union, the territories, including Hawaii and the provinces of Canada, in addition to film appearances in the studios of many of the major early Hollywood producers, end quote. How in the world? Have we not heard of I him? mean, what? yeah. Who else has no, done that? Can you think of any is. other actor in our modern era that can say, oh yeah, I've been on stage in every state in the Union and the territories? Because you could say, well, there wasn't that many states in the Union in the 1800s, but they said and the territories so whatever well, the territories it, existed i'm and i'm, I'm probably going to confuse my history here but it makes me think when we were talking about john wilkes booth didn't we talk about how actors at that time were traveling so mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. and he so i mean clearly this man had to be in some kind of a troop or or oh, he, he was. almost had yeah. a nomadic life just to yep. follow the yep so here's what else he did, which makes me feel like, what have I done with my life? He was also a playwright. And at the end of the 1884-85 season, quote, Neil returned to Savannah with a play he had written and persuaded J.C. Shaw of what was now called the Ford Dramatic Association to produce the new work as part of the seventh annual summer season of the group. So on the evening of June 18th, 1885, the Savannah Theater was the locale for the first performance on any stage of Mr. James Neal's romantic four-act drama, and it was called Chip Redmond, dot, dot, or The Moonshine Maid. <laughs> Don't know what it's about. Sounds interesting. It had four acts. So, hmm. okay. He had a lot to say about. He had a lot to say about the Ship made. and the Moonshine Maid. So we're going to skip ahead to 1893, tying it to okay. another episode, which is, if you remember the same year, H.H. H. Holmes was bebopping around the Chicago World's Fair, killing or not killing people, depending on who you ask. James was busy with more altruistic ventures. He, James, organized the first summer stock theater company for that season at the oh. Elitch Theater in Denver. The next Next year, James and his associate, R.L. Giffen, organized a company for the Manhattan Beach in Denver, which I'm only including because of a personal connection. And I kind of put this together through details. On the roster of actors for the company, which I didn't include the other people, there was a woman named Anne Blank, which happens to match the name listed of James's first wife. However, this marriage must have been on the rocks because while he married Anne in 1886, which is the year after he brought his play to Savannah, they divorced in 1894, the year after this stock company performed at Manhattan Beach. So I don't know when it went down, but it went good. But now that he's single, let's move over to Edith. Edith was born in Rochester, New York on October 8th, 1863. So a few months before the end of the Civil War. The next piece of information we have about her is when her stage career began. Nothing in between. It was in New York City around 1898 and she was around age 35. Wow. Yeah, but this That's is sick. 
it's significant because she and James had married the year before her first appearance, 1897. So he got her into acting. No, sort of. I think if you love James Neal, you either love the stage or you learn to love it. Mm -hmm. In fact, Wiki says they met in Cincinnati when she worked for his stock company, but doesn't say she was on stage there. So maybe I'm thinking she was a member of the backstage team at that point in time. And then after they got married, he said, no, girl, you're going to join me on the stage. I don't know. That's... I'm paraphrasing what he said. Edith's first show was called The Charity Ball. And in 1907, she got to perform at the Schubert Theater in Brooklyn in a romantic drama called The Light Eternal that boasted a cast of 100 people. Now there's a nightmare. Can you imagine having to direct and stage manage that? Yes. But these are the only two shows that were listed for her. But again, her Wikipedia page says she was James's frequent co-star on stage and screen. But she was a woman. And at that time, probably people were not recording maybe her accomplishments as much. I don't know. They recorded all of her movies. They just, it just maybe the stage stuff isn't out there. Yeah. I just don't know what shows they were specifically, but Edith and James must have really shown in the movies. Get this. James was listed in being in over 110 films between 1913, when he's 53, and 1930, the year before his death at age 70. That's 110 films in 12 years. And they weren't like 10 minute films. These are full length pictures, some of them. Now, Edith had roles in 79 films. Hmm. Yeah. Including a lead in Cecil B. DeMille's 1923 version of the Ten Commandments alongside James. She, oh. I found this on YouTube and I saw part of it. I, I didn't get to watch all of it. She is in some modern thing, story that they're telling. And James is Aaron, the brother of Moses. So they're not in a scene mm-hmm. together, but they're both in it. Okay. Edith, Edith also played Aunt Polly in the 1917 version of Tom Sawyer. Both of these are silent. Yeah. Now, an interesting piece of trivia about Edith is that because of her many maternal roles, she came to be known as Hollywood's mother. Her last role was also in 1930. So I'm going to speculate something. I'm going to speculate that James was ill and they both stepped away from acting to tend to his health. That's mm. that's guesswork. But considering right. this prolific output, something had to happen that year to make both of them take this unprecedented step back. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, James passed away on March 16th, 1931. Edith mm-hmm. never acted again, from what I can tell. She herself passed away October 15th, 1948 in Glendale, California. California after this brief illness a week after her 85th birthday but she Mm. was interred alongside her husband at Bonaventure so a little bit more about them I I was able to find Edith's films on YouTube her and James's version of Ten Commandments like I said is online I did watch one that starred Rudolph Valentino and Gloria Swanson that seriously captivated me but it's not the full film it was thought to have been lost it's been rediscovered and restored and I, I don't know if the full film exists somewhere but only the first 22 minutes are available online much to the despair of myself and a few other people who found it and were just as invested and were like where's the rest of it it's called wow. beyond the rocks and edith had a supporting role with only one scene before the end of the reel but she was really capable and what i was able to see and that takes us to the end of my first section well that's fascinating i knew nothing about them but how cool i thought it was very very cool well ashley We're going to move now into someone who's actually very controversial. Oh, yeah. I had heard this person's name and knew that he was buried not too far from where I live. So I thought, you know what, why not visit this site? I've even driven past, there's a, a historical marker alongside, you know, along the road that I've driven past before. And so I thought, you know what, if we're going to visit some grave sites, I think I will go visit this particular gentleman's burial site and find out a little bit more about him. And I was shocked to discover that he was controversial then. And I knew there was more controversy now, to be honest, but I didn't really know all the details and understand all the controversy, which I now get. So with that teaser in mind, here you go. I visited the gravesite of D.W. Griffith. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he was born in Oldham County, Kentucky. Some sources said LaGrange, some said Centerfield, Mm -hmm. but somewhere around in there uh, in January of 1875. And he lived on a farm that his parents owned. A few articles mentioned that he attended a one room schoolhouse where he was taught by his older 
older sister, Maddie. So his father, Jacob, was a bit of a jack of all trades. Um, it mentioned at different points that he was a doctor. He was a state legislator. He was a Confederate officer who was wounded during the Civil War, all kinds of different things. But it was that last one that I mentioned, his injury in the war that actually caused his family to fall on hard times. Mm. And then Jacob passed away when oh. um, D.W. Griffith was only 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So that's when, you know, his mom was really struggling to support the family. So she ended up having to abandon the farm, move the kids to Louisville to try to earn money by running a boarding house, which also was not very successful. Successful. At some point, D.W. Griffith had to leave high school and help out by working different places. I think he worked at a dry goods store, a bookstore, different places. So he really didn't have a lot of formal education, but he was in a way self-taught because they said he was a huge reader and he would spend a lot of time in the library and also doing some reading in that bookstore. And he was determined to be a playwright. So when he was still very young, he left home and he decided he was going to make a living as as an actor and learn all about the craft. And for about 12 years or so, that's what he did. He worked all kinds of different places, crisscrossed the country is the way they phrased it, acting in a lot of different productions. And they made a point of saying he must have been analytical. Like he kept looking at how do you really tell a story? Mm -hmm. How do you really sell a story to mm -hmm. an audience? Like he was very analytical. And then he decided to turn that to directing. And that's where he made his name. So I'm, I don't have all the details, sure. but Lillian Gish, who was one of the stars that he's been given credit for discovering, kind of, yes, discovering, called him the father of film. Oh. Charlie Chaplin called him the teacher of us all. Oh. And at one point he actually screened one of his films for one of the presidents. It may have been more than one. I mean, this was a very well-known fella for that time frame. Oh. He had um, he had some acclaim. He had some fame behind him. Now, here's where the controversy comes in. His most famous work was Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. And it was, it came out in 1915. It was a three hour length film. A See, silent film. him and James's four act play, I think people didn't have as much to do back then. I mean, of course they didn't. They didn't have, well, they did, but they didn't have as much entertainment. So there wasn't the television, radio. You had newspaper books and you had the time to go sit and watch a four act or a three hour movie but now we're watching three hour movies you know marvel we'll watch a three hour movie it just depends on how captivating it is and and i'm doing a little inferring here mm -hmm. but that wasn't normal so I think part of sitting through a three hour movie, three hour, three hour length movie was the fact that this was so innovative. It was new in so many ways. They said it was a massive leap forward in terms of filmmaking technology at that time. He was using techniques that had never been used before. He was able to make something that was sustained over that length of a time in a film like that that itself was new and mm. and novel to mm -hmm. people this film made a name for him in terms of how well received it was how innovative it was how much credit he was given for pushing filmmaking forward and then on the flip side even at that time period it caused controversy because especially a lot of black people were doing they were protesting against it mm -hmm. because they were calling it out for its blatant racism and historical inaccuracies mm -hmm. And one of the things that they also pointed out was it glorified the Ku Klux Klan. Mm. So it was, it was this whole thing, even in that time period, there were people who didn't see all of those problems with it because their belief system at that time Aligned didn't allow them to understand what was going on with this film. And then other people, of course, were protesting. But despite all of that, it was still labeled as a smash hit hit. It was the most commercially successful film made in the United States to that point. And in this article on this website called liveabout.com, it said that Birth of a Nation held the record of the highest grossing film of all time until 1939 when oh, Gone with the Wind came out. Yeah. So despite the controversy, it was a huge hit. One fella, a guy named Dick Lair, who wrote a book about the impact of this particular film, he was quoted in an NPR article as saying, he did things that hadn't been done before in terms of close-up, zooming the camera in on faces, cross-cutting in dramatic Civil War battle scenes, not just taking a single static shot, all of which heightened the power, the impact, the drama, the emotion. 
Mm -hmm. So this was a film that because of all these techniques touched people in ways that I think other films hadn't been able to reach people before. And then his second film was also very innovative and well-received called Intolerance. That was 1916. And this time he pushed filmmaking forward by doing something else that was new. He, he basically juxtaposed these four different like settings and eras. So it was almost like he kind of brought four different stories together in a way. And so that was new. Mm. That took people, you know, by surprise and, and that appealed to them. And then he did other notable things. Again, I'm just kind of hitting the surface here. But one thing he did was in 1919, he co-founded United Artists with okay. Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and Mary Pickford. Pickford. Yeah. And this was huge because this was a production company. Where they took that, power. Yep. The whole point of it was to enable actors and directors to make films on their own terms yep, yep. instead of being a studio subject, film. yep those studio films it, it broke up that monopoly and that huge mm -hmm. power play from the other commercial studios so that was big and he again he's been noted for finding several of those stars you know he was given credit for that he went on to make several other big films he broke ground in other ways. Uh, just to give a couple of examples, one article said that he was the first person ever to host test screenings of his works while they were still in progress to kind of get some feedback and use that. I like that. Yeah. That's a good idea. So another article said that he almost single-handedly invented the art of modern cinema. Mm. But despite all that, he fell on hard times in terms of his career during the last 15 or so years of his life. They said that he couldn't find work. Things had moved on without him and the young people, that's mm. the way they phrased it, the young people were not finding his work as appealing. It seemed like he was kind of outdated. So he had kind of a sad end. He died July 23rd, 1948 of this hemorrhage, a cerebral hemorrhage. He was in a hotel in Los Angeles, California, and he is buried in the cemetery that is on the grounds of Mount Tabor Methodist Church in Crestwood, Kentucky. Now, he was posthumously awarded a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1960. In 1964 is when that historical marker that I mentioned, the one that I've driven past, that's when mm -hmm. it was erected by the Kentucky Historical Society and the Kentucky Department of Highways. Mm -hmm. So he had lots of acclaim, lots of awards, different things, but the controversy has followed continued him. and actually hugely escalated as people have been become more aware and more watching that earlier film and seeing it. I yeah, haven't seen it, it. I've never seen it either, but they said that it's become so controversial that in, in some cases they don't even know how to handle it because one example they gave in, in an article was if you're going to have the history of filmmaking, you almost have to include him and his yeah. film, but then yeah. there are people who don't want to because of yeah. the race them and the you know the the historical yeah. inaccuracies and the different yeah. things that that were very offensive yeah so that was an example here's a second example in 1953 the directors guild of america instituted the dw griffith award as its highest honor mm. they came back in december of 1999 and announced that they were going to rename that award to the dga Lifetime Achievement Award. Director's Guild and the leader stated mm -hmm. that although they felt that he was extremely talented, and even though they knew his film was groundbreaking, they said, quote, it had also helped foster intolerable racial stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And then therefore it was better not to, to have that top him. award in his honor. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting. Because, it is. Yeah, it just shows how, you know, not everything's nice and clean, you know? No, it's I not. Mean, and you would love for history to be, history to be full of good people and good events, but it's not. And it still happened. I, I don't like the idea of erasing people or erasing history because it still happened. And sometimes the biggest lessons we can learn is what not to do from people who went before. I understand why they renamed the award. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder just personally, if he, if he recanted those beliefs later in life, whatever, you know, neither of, neither of us have seen the film, but whatever he purports in this, I wonder if he was even embarrassed by it at a later time. It sounds like no, or they would bring that up. I, I didn't see anything like that, but again, mm -hmm. I also did not do this incredibly deep, deep yeah. Re yeah, research. If anybody so. knows, let us know. Yeah. Well, that was D.W. Griffith. 
Let's hear, let's hear your next person. So my next person is someone that, you know, he could have done a little bit less in his life. (laughs) Just to help you out. Just to help me out. So many years later, four hours in this man's life. So inconsiderate to be so accomplished. I'm just going to put that out there. But Johnny Mercer had to be amazing. And (laughs) he is my next subject. So Johnny Herndon Mercer is believed to be the most well-known person buried in Bonaventure Cemetery. So of course we had to cover him. His biography is massive. And I'm going to include a link to his Wikipedia page, which is what I actually preferred to use. I read another one. I read his page and I typed in Google short bio of Johnny Mercer. And I read it. I actually didn't like it. So I went back to the Wiki page. You can dive down a Mercer rabbit hole. It is enormous. I'm going to try and distill most of these facts from the Wiki page because we have got a lot of ground to cover. No pun intended. Oh, (laughs) Johnny, Johnny was born November 18th, 1909 and raised in Savannah, Georgia. Okay. Fact number one, we have a lot of facts. Number one, my first fact is that at age 10, Johnny had his first job working sweeping floors at Leopold's ice cream. This matters because in the connectivity of things, that original 1919 location was only a block away from Johnny's childhood home on East Gwinnett and Habersham. Remember I told you, remember that name, Habersham? Yep. Habersham Street was named for James Habersham, the son of John Habersham, who bought those original acres back for the Tattnall family, which eventually became Bonaventure Cemetery. Oh, I love nice it. Nice connection. Yep. Mm-hmm. Number two, family connections. So many connections. Johnny's father, George Anderson Mercer. Some places said junior, another place just George Anderson Mercer without the junior. He was a prominent attorney and real estate developer and a former business partner of Andrew Carnegie. You've heard of that guy. So they had some money. Johnny's mother, Lillian Elizabeth, was George's second wife and his former secretary. Now his first wife, Mary, died at age 29. So I don't think we have the secretary trope going on here. Johnny (laughs) was the, you know what I'm saying? Like I was wondering. Johnny was the fourth son but the first by Lillian. Another connection is that his great-grandfather was Confederate General Hugh Whedon Mercer who began but did not finish because the Civil War interrupted him the construction of the Mercer Williams house which we know as the house featured in the Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Connection. Look at this. I know. He, Johnny, is also a distant cousin of General George S. Patton and is a direct descendant of General Hugh Mercer, a soldier physician in the American Revolutionary War. So as a bonus, I'm going to show you right here, General Hugh Whedon Mercer's grave. Okay, didn't research anything else about him. That's just the fellow that started the construction of the Mercer Williams house. Fact number three, music is in this man's DNA. Johnny's mother and father both sang. Lillian sang sentimental ballads and George sang old Scottish songs while his aunt, Johnny's aunt, took him to see minstrel and vaudeville shows. So he's being exposed to all kinds of music. Mm -hmm. Mercer himself said, quote, songs always fascinated me more than anything, end quote. A little later, another person said about Johnny, quote, he had no formal music training, but was singing in a choir by six and at 11 or 12, he had memorized almost all the songs he had heard and became curious about who wrote them. So he asked his brother who the best songwriter was and his brother said Irving Berlin end quote. So number four, fact number four he's got personality. As a teenager and young man growing up, Johnny was described alternately as a prankster class clown, reckless driver, a flirt, a humor <laughs> writer for his school's publications terrible at playing the piano and trumpet and it was said that he couldn't read musical scores, instead relying on his own system. Huh. So it's also during this time that he began to write songs, often just using rhyme phrases he had scribbled down earlier in his youth because he liked to do that. Mm -hmm. He was not a great student, but he was originally slated to go to Princeton until his father had some financial setbacks in the late 20s, I'm guessing due to the depression. He started to work for his father by, quote, running errands and collecting rent, but soon grew bored with the routine and with Savannah. I don't know how you can get bored with Savannah, but that's what happens when you get used to paradise, I guess. So, okay, Johnny. Fact number five, his first lyric led to meeting his wife. Oh, yes. Johnny moved to New York in 1928 at age 19, where he started off as an actor and then transitioned to working for a brokerage house for his day job, but ended up returning to singing and lyric writing at night, often combining his income with his roommates and eating oatmeal to survive. The artist's life, we all know. From Wikipedia, quote, Mercer's first lyric for the song 
Out of Breath and Scared to Death of You, composed by friend Everett Miller, appeared in a musical review called The Garrick Gaieties in 1930. So he's been in New York for a couple of years. Mercer met his future wife at the show, chorus girl Ginger Meehan. She had earlier been one of the many chorus girls pursued by the young crooner Bing Crosby. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Through Miller's father, an executive at the prominent music publisher T.B. Harms, Mercer's first song was published and it was recorded by Joe Venuti and the New Yorkers, end quote. So that got him meeting Ginger. After this, he becomes friends with other songwriters to strengthen his abilities. He moves to California for a lyric writing assignment and meets his idols, Bing Crosby and Louis Armstrong. But he doesn't really like it there because he prefers freestanding music to assignments for musicals. He liked writing songs that just kind of stood on their own. So he comes mm -hmm. back to New York and he, quote, got a job as a staffed lyricist for Miller Music for $25 a week, which gave wow. him a base income and enough prospects to win over and marry ginger in 1931 oh so, yes now ginger was of jewish heritage and he was kind of afraid that some parts of his family were not going to accept her so he decided not to tell his parents that they got married until they were already married so, <laughs> it's, it's just done come on johnny i know it's so to save money ginger quit the chorus line and became a seamstress she and Johnny moved in with her mother in Brooklyn, and later in life, they adopted their daughter, Amanda, whom they nicknamed Mandy, and that kind of comes into play a little bit later on. Fact number six, we're halfway through our facts. When he finally hit it big, he he never stopped. It, mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it never stopped. After some hits, and there were a few hits and misses in the early 30s that did not do much for his fame, but it strengthened his talent and connections. But he finally hits it big when he's paired with Hoagie Carmichael. Now, usually Johnny's able to turn out these lyrics really really fast but this time mm -hmm. he works for over a year on these lyrics for i think it was a song called lazy bones hmm. it pays off because it becomes this huge hit one week after its release this got him a large royalty check a membership ascap ascap and mm -hmm. it put him on the radar of irving berlin george gershwin and cole porter who all called to yeah. congratulate him so remember his brother told him who's the best songwriter irving berlin and here really? he is getting the congratulatory call from the guy so in in the mid-30s the reviews with the kind of standalone songs that johnny loved to write gave way to the movie musical with songs that drove the plot johnny and ginger found themselves back on the golden coast of california where johnny was hired to write songs and perform in RKO musicals. Hmm. Fact number seven, Hollywood was very good to Johnny Mercer. After he and Ginger moved in 1935, Johnny began writing for films almost exclusively and his output was prolific to say the least. However, on a personal front, this is a little sad. He fell in with some hard drinking colleagues and he began to drink heavily, which changed his behavior from like kind and gentle to pretty vicious when he's under no. the influence. I know. To in his fact, family or in, in general? In general. In fact, on the mornings oh. after, he started to regularly send flowers and apologies to those he had offended the night before. Oh no. Yes. I don't know if he gave all that up. It it didn't, it just said, this is when this happened. So I'm hoping that he straightened up, but that's what happened to him then. Now, professionally- For some reason, the um, Historical Society didn't include that in the little bio on the yeah, app for Bonaventure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's another thing they probably didn't include in just a little bit, because oh, no. I had never heard it. I was like, what? Okay. Professionally, he wrote his first big hit for Bing Crosby, I'm an Old Cow Hand from the Rio Grande. Mm. And he followed it up with more hits you may have heard of, Hooray for Hollywood, Jeepers Creepers, and You Must Have Been a Beautiful Baby, which wow. incidentally is the song lyric inscribed on Ginger's grave. It says, you must have been a beautiful baby. Oh. Johnny finished out 1939 by writing lyrics for what became the song And the Angels Sing, which is inscribed on his own grave. Fact number eight, New York was also very good to Johnny Mercer. So as good as the 30s were, the 40s were phenomenal. He moves back to the East Coast temporarily, where he was invited on something called the Camel Caravan Radio Show in New York to write and sing. He becomes the MC for the show for several months. He wrote two more hits, Day In, Day Out, and Fools Rush In, which gives Johnny Mercer five of the 10 top songs on your hit parade. Five of the 10 are written by Johnny Mercer. So his two missteps seem to be that he created a publishing company that did not last, and he and Hoagie Carmichael worked on a musical called Walk With Music that was not a success. Mm, okay. But he bounces back by being paired with a man named Harold Arlen to write mm. Blues in the Night that was called, quote, probably the greatest blues song ever written. Really? Yeah. 
he and Harold then wrote one for my baby and one more for the road accentuate the positive that old black magic and come rain or come shine we've heard of all of these except the one that's supposed to be the one that's I know the most I've not heard of well that of, I, now I have to hear that I know we'll, we'll have, have to look it up we'll have to put a link but guess yeah. what I'm not even to 1941 yet oh he did gosh. all that yes before 1941 Okay, I, I do want to say at this point that I've been trying to remember to list his composing partners when I can. And remember, he's a lyric writer, not a music writer. Mm -hmm. But he worked with so many different people. I really recommend going you can't to his hit them all. You, I just can't. Fact number nine. This was the other little thing I did not know. Fact number nine is Johnny Loves Judy. One thing that did happen on a personal front is that in 1941, about 10 years into their marriage, he cheated on Ginger. I don't know if this was his only infidelity, but it's the only one mentioned and probably because of who it was with. 32-year-old Johnny Garland. had an affair with 19-year-old Judy Garland. <gasps> 19? He's 32. Ooh. Well, she's she's over 18, but still, it's not good. Yeah, that's true. But she was engaged to somebody else and she broke it off with Johnny when she married the other man. However, they did rekindle their romance later in life. Johnny admits to writing the song, I Remember You, as an expression of the depth of his feelings for Judy. I'm not sure how Ginger feels about him admitting this, but she outlived him by over 20 years, so she must have known. If he publicly says, this song is about my love for Judy Garland, hmm. so there's that. So, that aside, yes, that aside, he wrote many more hits, one being on the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe for Judy's film, The Harvey Girls, for which he also won his first of four Academy Awards for Best song lest you think he got that one right out of the gate he had been nominated eight times at that point wow now fact number 10 so many facts he discovered nat king cole and how did he still, discover we're, we're only in 1942 like all of this was early 40s he founded Capitol records in 1942 and co-founded cowboy records under Capitol. single-handedly did Capitol records it did not say co-founded for okay yeah. It says founded, but it says co-founded cowboy. That's what I saw. Under mm -hmm. Capitol, he signed many artists, one of whom was Nat King Cole. That didn't say how he found him, but he did sign him. Mm -hmm. Now, by the mid-40s, this man's in a league of his own. He had a he had this like fantastic ability to ebb and flow with the languages of the time. And he preferred to have the music first. So he's able to craft the words to fit the established flow of the music. It's almost like when others hear simply music, Johnny can hear the unspoken words within that music this mm -hmm. also meant he could take established popular songs and write new lyrics to them so he did this for stuff like laura and satin doll and autumn leaves fact number 11 rock rolled johnny into broadway after a stint in radio that was also successful imagine that johnny looked to be finally toppled by an unstoppable flow which is rock and roll Mm. When this new music captivated his old audience, he tried to counter by writing for some MGM films, including Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. And then he for Seven Bride for Seven Brothers. I love did. that musical. And then he heads to Broadway where he worked on three musicals, one of which was Little Abner. And we have a hometown connection to that as Little Abner's mm -hmm. original Broadway lead and the subsequent films lead, Peter Palmer, retired to the town very close to us before he passed away. Mm -hmm. Number 12, Johnny Mercer dominates film with back to back Oscar wins. Now, after briefly appearing on television, he dominated the 1960s movie scores. Paired with music by Henry Mancini, he wrote the lyrics for 1961's Moon River, the title mm. song of Breakfast at Tiffany's, which is probably yes. what most people think of when they think of him. And then he also wrote 1962's Days of Wine and Roses for the film of the same name. That got him his third and fourth Oscars, the first time a songwriting team had achieved such an honor. It was him and wow. Henry Mancini. By the way, his second win was for the 1951 song In the Cool, Cool, Cool of the Evening with Hoagie Carmichael. So he finishes out the 60s with the theme song for 1963's Charade, also with Henry Mancini. On the crooner front, he wrote the lyrics for 1962's I Want to Be Around by Tony Bennett and 1965's Summer Wind, made famous by Frank Sinatra, as you do. So that's his 60s. Wow. Fact number 13, we're almost done. He said it was all luck and timing. From the wiki article, quote, Mercer was humble about his work, attributing much of his success to luck and timing. He was fond of telling the story of how he was offered the job of doing the lyrics for Johnny Mandel's music on the Sandpiper, only to have the producer turn his lyrics down. The producer offered the commission to Paul Francis Webster, and the result was The Shadow of Your Smile, which became a huge hit, winning the 65 Oscar for Best Original Song. However, Mercer and Mandel did collaborate on the 64 song, Emily, from the Americanization of Emily, starring Julie Andrews, end quote. So now we come to his end of life facts. Mm. These are kind of quick. 
1969, he co-founded the National Academy of Popular Music Songwriters Hall of Fame. In 71, he presents a retrospective of his career for the Lyrics and Lyricists series in New York. In 74, he collaborates on the production The Good Companions and records two albums of his songs in London that's later released as the album My Huckleberry Friend, Johnny Mercer, sings the songs of Johnny Mercer. 1976, he becomes fond of and friends with Barry Manilow, partly due to Barry's first hit song, Mandy, being the same name as his daughter, Amanda. After his death, Ginger gives Barry some of Johnny's unfinished lyrics, one of which Barry turned into the song When October Goes, which of course became a huge hit. June 25th, 1976, quote, Johnny dies from an inoperable brain tumor in the Bel Air neighborhood of Los Angeles, California. He was buried in Savannah's historic Bonaventure Cemetery. The line drawing caricature adorning his memorial bench is a reproduction of a self-portrait, end quote. Now, we have a, just a little bit left because here's some legacy of his. Mm-hmm. This is from Wikipedia. I'm just going to quote. In 1980, the Songwriters Hall of Fame established the annual Johnny Mercer Award as its highest honor for the mm-hmm. songwriters with a history of outstanding creative works, kind of like what the D.W. Griffith yeah. Award was. He was honored by the United States Postal Service with his portrait placed on the stamp in 1996. Mm-hmm. He got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, which we really need to do an episode on how to get a star. I'm interested in that. And it is a block away from Capitol Records building, his star is. And as a direct tie-in to my next series of grave sites, which I know we're going to go back to you, but when it's back to me, Mercer was given tribute in John Barrett's 1994 novel, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. The 1997 film, directed by Clint Eastwood, features prominently with lots of Hoagie Carmichael, Johnny Mercer songs, Skylark. It contains 14 other of his songs performed by artists such as Alison Krauss, Paula Cole, Cassandra Wilson, and the film star Kevin Spacey sang his 1942 hit, That Old Black Magic. Mm. That is Johnny Ooh. Mercer. My um, knowledge of him was from that Bonaventure historical app. And yeah. so, and, and I actually, I think if I can find it, I'll include it. I have a picture of, of when Kirk and I visited and I was, I, I was seated on his bench. Yeah. Yeah. Know. I took a picture, but yeah. I didn't sit on it. I just don't, I just don't know how I feel about all that. I sat like outside the family. I know you can, it just, oh. I thought, and maybe I'm misremembering because it's been a while, but I thought the bench was almost placed there because he was inviting people. I'm like, sure he to, was. I just sit. Didn't like yeah I I, and I may be mixing up stories but it was almost like this was a place where you know he said somebody should come and sit and have a drink and and reflect I I may you might be mixing him up with somebody else I'm going to cover in a minute okay okay we'll see all right yeah. But what yeah. I will say is back to that app, I had no idea he had accomplished all that. Just giving a few of the highlights and listing some yes. of the songs they did. It was I didn't even list all of them. Unbelievable. I couldn't list all of them. Song after song. Yeah. Crazy. That is mm-hmm. one that was one talented man. Yeah, it was. And he is buried in his uh, family plot. So Candy, before we continue on, why don't we take a little break so I can get a drink of water? That sounds like a fabulous idea. All right. <laughs> so my final one took me by surprise too. I was looking for someone in our region that, you know, maybe I was unaware of, you mm-hmm. know, because the other two obviously were, you know, Muhammad Ali and D.W. Griffith. I heard a lot about them. So I thought, mm-hmm. well, who else is somewhere in this region th- with whom I may not be as familiar? And I was shocked to discover that Rosie the Riveter oh. was buried in New Albany, Indiana. Wow. Now, as I started to research Here's what fascinated me. So I came across this Vanity Fair article that posed this interesting idea. The title was, Why You Keep Reading Obituaries for Rosie the Riveter. Mm -hmm, Because there was more than one. Yes. Yeah. And I never really thought about that before. And so this Vanity Fair article, as well as others, helped me piece it together. But just to give you a very quick little timeline, I think everybody knows that World
World War II was that time when they needed women to, to step in and mm -hmm. to really help out with the war effort. But so many of the men had been taken off to fight. And so there was so many campaigns, actually. But one of the campaigns was this Rosie the Riveter, where they were trying to really encourage women to step up and show how they could be patriotic and how they could do these jobs that the men had typically done. So most people think it started with this Pittsburgh artist named J. Howard Miller, who created her prototype basically mm. when he had this 1942 poster for Westinghouse Electric Corporation that had this character, Rosie, the first Rosie, and it had her picture oh. there and then underneath it said, we can do it. So they're not positive what inspired that poster, but what they do feel pretty sure about is that it was based on this photograph of this woman who was working in a factory at that time. She was basically in this kind of jumpsuit working on this industrial machine. She had low heels, but she had her hair and that polka dot bandana uh -huh. that's you know being safe she was gorgeous i saw the photo and i'll put it in our show notes but for a long long time they thought that was this lady named geraldine hoff doyle who was working at this metal press factory in 1942 in michigan well this other lady over the years had said that photo was me if that oh. photo was the inspiration for this poster that's me it's been misidentified oh that was me so her name was naomi parker and when she was 20 years old she was working in a machine shop at the naval air station in alameda california and she remembered a picture being taken of her mm. and she kept telling people this was her so Finally, I think it was in like 2016, maybe they finally actually came out and said, they do think this was her. They waited that and long to tell her she was right. Ooh. Well, I mean, it took, it took that long to kind of trace it back. She was excited to finally get that rec That's recognition right. before she passed away, uh -huh. which she did by the way, at age of 96 in 2018. Wow. Now, and the, the truth came out in 2016. She did hang on. Yeah. She said, I yeah. want the truth. That's cool. Now, one of the things that these different articles clarified was that actually wasn't the thing that that skyrocketed Rosie the Riveter. Those oh. posters were only out for a couple of weeks in Westinghouse in um, 1943, and then they were replaced by other propaganda type posters. Hmm. You know, different different campaigns that were going on. But she was out there, and what came next was this song. It was a 1943 song called Rosie the Riveter, written by Red. Evans and John Jacob Leb, and they said that's what did it because this okay. song was hugely popular, widespread, the public latched onto it. And again, now the character is really out there. That song was inspired by a Long Island woman named Rosalind P. Walter. She was a riveter who worked on Cosair fighter planes. So now we have a second Rosie the Riveter inspiration mm -hmm. that's been identified. Next thing was when Norman Rockwell incredibly popular painter yes. that we all know he put rosie the riveter on a saturday evening post cover that'll do it yep and it did <laughs> may 29th 1943 so he portrayed rosie and he beefed her up he had her looking he she had like painted nails and some of these feminine characteristics but then he had her you know, she had strong muscles and she mm -hmm. looked very strong. And he even had Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf under her feet. Oh. She had a lunchbox that said Rosie on it. And people, of course, connected it to the song. And what was cute was I went on to the Norman Rockwell Museum website. They actually had a little interview with his model his inspiration she talks about it and as well as a few of these articles and the website itself turns out his model was a 19 year old lady named mary doyle keefe and she was a telephone operator who lived near norman rockwell and she says in her interview that the people in the town would just kind of get a call from him sometimes he'd be like hey i need a model you <laughs> want to do this i think she got 10 bucks maybe yeah and so he used her as his rosy model and then he had to come back and apologize to her later because because she was apparently kind of a, this petite framed woman, thin, and he decided he was making a statement and he mm. had put a lot of meat on muscle. her and, mm -hmm. and made a lot of muscle. And just at that time frame, you know, during that time period, it was women were supposed to be leaner. So he actually, you know, that was their, their perception that women uh -huh. should be kind of more petite. So he called her and apologized. She Aww. remembered that. Yeah. But it was hugely popular and the government 
actually asked Norman Rockwell if he would loan them out that cover. So the U.S. Treasury Department used it for the duration of the war as something to to try to get drives for war bonds. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. now this is where we get to Rosie that we know. Okay. All right. Our Rosie is Rose Will Monroe, or some sites call her Rose Lee Monroe. I think one of those is her maiden name and one is a married name, and I'm not sure which is which, but Rose Monroe is basically um, the name that is on her grave site. Okay. She grew up in Somerset, Kentucky. She, there were nine brothers and sisters, and her daughter said, quote, she was the one who was a tomboy who could use tools. She mm. could do everything. When she was in her young 20s, her husband was killed in a car accident mm. and she had to support her family, her kids. So she joined the workforce. And by this time she was in Michigan and she started working in an aircraft parts factory. She was actually a riveter helping to build B-24 bombers for the war. Nice. And one day, Walter Pigeon, an actor, came into her aircraft factory because he was going to be in a promotional film for the war. Yeah. And somebody said, hey, you know, we've got a real Rosie here because her, because name her name's Rose. Rose. Yeah. And she was a riveter. Yeah. So they introduced Walter Pigeon to Rose and he and the producers decided they couldn't pass that up. So they got this Rose, Rose Monroe, to be in this documentary that was aimed at selling war bonds. Gotcha. Now, two different articles said that our Rose from Kentucky, this Rose Monroe, may be the most famous, I should say our, our Rose, who was born in Kentucky, also yeah. from Indiana, because that's where she passed away, that she may be the most famous Rosie because she was in the documentary. She was ah. in that film that was so widespread. Okay. She was. Uh, said to be ahead of her time by her granddaughter. After the war was over, she drove a cab. She operated a beauty shop. She founded Rose Builders, which was a construction company nice. that specialized in building luxury homes. And she wanted, during the war, she wanted to fly planes. And they told her that she was a single mother. And, you know, that wasn't something that, you know, a woman could do at that time, especially, you know, with kids. So when she was in her 50s, she went back and got her pilot's license and Good she job, Rose. a pilot. Nice. Somewhere along the lines after the war had ended, she had also married a man named Calvin Will. And oh, there we go. That's why it was That's Will is her middle name. Gotcha. She married Calvin Will and she settled in Clarksville, Indiana. And she passed away in 1997 while she was still living there. And so she is buried in Abundant Life Memorial Gardens in New Albany, Indiana. Hmm. Since she passed in 2007, her hometown, they're very proud of her. And so the Somerset Junior Woman's Club did this campaign and they managed to get a portion of Kentucky 1247 named in her honor. Hmm. So there is now a Rose Lee Monroe Memorial Highway sign that's erected along the road where it's been named after her. And just in the past Six to 12 months, Clarksville has decided they want to honor this lady of whom they are so proud. So the Clarksville Historic Preservation Commission ran a funding campaign in order to raise money to create a monument honoring wow. Rose Monroe and her contributions to Rosie the Riveter. They raised about $130,000. And by the time this airs, her new monument wow. will have been unveiled. It's supposed to be unveiled. We are, um, guys, we are recording this on September 14th mm -hmm. and it will be unveiled on September 16th oh, at two more days. Park in Clarksville. It's in it, the monument as it's still in its workshop, gotcha. but you'll get a sense of what it'll look like. Very cool. So there we go. Very Rosie. nice. Okay. So for my final section, I am covering connections to Midnight and the Garden of Good and Evil because that's kind mm -hmm. of been around a theme around it. It's not going to contain a lot of fine detail. One, because there are still maybe some people out there who would like to read the book or watch the film and may not want the events spoiled. And second, time constraints, because I'm going to jump around a lot and our focus is on the graves, not the full story. But you got to start with the house, the Mercer Williams house. 
As I mentioned earlier, this home's construction was begun by Johnny Mercer's great-great-grandfather. It was interrupted by the Civil War, but it was finished in 1868 after General Mercer sold the building to John R. Wilder. So in a little twist of irony, no member of the Mercer family ever lived in the home that is named after them, thereby Ooh. setting up confusion for thousands of people many years <laughs> later. <laughs> so they're all like, oh, Johnny Mercer lived here. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the reason is apparently the tradition in savannah is to use the name of the original family combined with the most prominent family which in this case was a single man named james a williams Mercer well, that's williams. interesting yeah, i don't know if i'd ever heard that before yeah, I hadn't. in 1969 james bought what was essentially a vacant property and spent two years renovating the home into what would become his permanent private residence on my first trip to Savannah back in July, I was able to take a tour of the Mercer Williams house with my friends Lori and Jill. And while we were not allowed to take photos of the inside, I did get a photo of the outside. The website, however, does have selected photos of the inside of the home. So it's in the study of this house that the true crime event happened that the novel and subsequent movie were based on. Depending on who or what you believe, James Williams may or may not have shot a man who may or may not have been his lover. And we're going to leave it there for folks who would like to read the book or see the film. But now we do have to move into the book. So speaking of the book, a summary I found on the site Book Rags that I really like says, quote, this suspenseful story about a 1981 murder trial in Savannah, Georgia was written in 1994. While based on true events and characters and therefore not a novel by true definition, the book is full of descriptive narration and dynamic, strongly identifiable figures. The author, John Barrent, I hope I'm saying that correctly, draws a vivid picture of Savannah's residence while creating a book that revolves around the themes of money, isolation, illusion, and good versus evil, end quote. I have read the book and I found it very interesting. It's funny because my friend had recommended I read it before I went to Savannah my first time and I didn't yeah. have a chance to. And I read it after and I actually was happy that I had seen Savannah first. Because, really? Yes. Because, you can picture it in your head? Yes. It was, okay. there were so many places and elements that I, that made sense to me. I had like okay. the flavor. I, okay. I appreciated it more. Well, maybe I, you can answer a question I have a little bit later. And now it's been a while. Well, <laughs> so. you, you might know because I, I didn't, I've seen the movie, but it's been a really long time. So now on the cover of the novel, we have a photo of a statue that would come to be known as the bird girl. But where did she come from? I will tell you. So from the website Roadside America, quote, sculpted in 1936, Bird Girl by Sylvia Shaw Judson stood in obscurity for decades in Savannah's Bonaventure Cemetery, where it was named Little Wendy by the family that paid for it. That ended in 1994 when a photo of the statue appeared on the cover of the best-selling Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil and acquired its new Bird Girl name. Fans flocked to the cemetery and some began chipping off pieces of the statue's base for souvenirs. Oh. Again, this is why we can't have nice things. The family grabbed their statue and moved it into Savannah's Telfair Museum, where no chipping is allowed. Sylvia Shaw Judson was dead long before the book was published. She had made several exact duplicates of her statue, so there are a handful of bird girls floating around out there, but the one in Savannah is the famous one. Mm -hmm. Judson isn't buried in Bonaventure Cemetery, but the guy who took the photo is, end quote. So that last sentence made me wonder, who took the photo? And where was that original family plot? Where was she originally? So it turns out the Trosdale family plot is the original home of the Bird Girl statue. And I did take a photograph of the plot, but after returning home and doing research for this segment, I found a very informative article, which I will put in our show notes that says, since the release of the book and film, the family has removed the statue, which we've already said, redesigned the greenery to make it look less recognizable and have requested their plot not be given out publicly by the cemetery. Mm. So this makes sense as to why it was the hardest to find and to respect that family's wishes i'm not gonna post the photograph but i am going to tell you it was very peaceful and very a very beautiful view mm -hmm. now moving on to the man who took the photograph jack lee is a photographer who snapped the now iconic photo of little wendy so who was he? And I found this blog by a gentleman named Shannon Scott. And I think he actually is a tour guide, um, but I just was very zooming through and reading. But he, he said this so beautifully, and I'm going to read from his blog, quote, he was a sage soul, quiet and reserved. I don't mean this negatively at all, but he was one of those creative people who lived more in his head. And although he paid the world great attention and was very good natured, you could tell when it came to earthly plane relationships ships, he was merely taking a momentary break from playing fifth dimensional chess somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I think some souls belong to that world of their own and Jack had earned it. So it was hard in a sense to know 
him. He spoke words in a chuckle, an understanding nod, or well-meaning smile. I'm not sure if he was conscious of this part of himself or if that was just him, end quote. Mm. I think I would have really liked Jack. So Shannon goes on to write later in his blog about this actual picture. He says, quote, his ex-wife, photographer, and my close friend, so Shannon's close friend, Susan, once humorously spoke in regard to Jack taking the famous photo for the dust jacket of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. She says that in 1992, Jack had been given nothing but the title of the book by Random House. And one pre-dawn morning, he went to Bonaventure to look for something that suited. Now I'm going to pause from the quote to say, I found other places that say he took the picture at dusk. And I don't know if Shannon's indicating that he took the picture at dawn or I, I do know that I read he spent two days in the cemetery looking for something. And at mm. the end of the second day, he found the bird girl. So I, right. I, just saying that for now, we'll continue with the quote quote again maybe not even knowing he'd find it there how fascinating that this one artist's instinct would forever make bonaventure the garden and savannah a worldwide household name jack later expressed to susan he'd laid eyes on the statue then known as little wendy in a family plot directly overlooking the river that in his eye it was as if the statue was holding the whole of bonaventure behind her and the fates of the souls simultaneous this would be the beginning of his unconscious botticelli moment little did jack know his his camera and later darkroom workings of creating moonlight in the image would give birth to the Venus of Savannah. I'm going to pause from the quote there again to say he created that that visual whiteness around her. He created through dodging, which means he manually lightened the area all around oh. the statue. So he okay. did he did an effect um, that made that. So again, okay, keeping with the quote. What made Susan laugh was that Jack casually expressed to her that he courted the fog in order to get his legacy shot. Only an artist could coin that one. Yes, perhaps in Jack's quiet reserve, he could literally siphon such moments with the energy he didn't spend speaking. And like the camera nature, he let the work speak for him, end quote. So Shannon later in his blog goes on to reveal that Jack passed away at the age of 55 from colon cancer, rumored wow. to have possibly been contracted from the years of exposure to darkroom chemicals. Oh, I know. That's sad. He's buried in his family plot toward the front of Bonaventure. Mm. So now we go on to the film. From Wikipedia, quote, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is a 1997 American mystery thriller film directed and produced by Clint Eastwood, starring John Cusack, which I'd forgotten he was in that, and Kevin Spacey. The screenplay by John Lee Hancock was based on John Barrett's 1994 book of the same name. We know this. Several real-life locals appear in the movie, notably in the party scene at the Mercer House, including Williams' sister Dorothy and his nieces Susan and Amanda, as well as the Georgia senator John R. Jack Riley. His wife was played by Mary Alice Hendricks. Filming was permitted inside Mercer House, but action scenes were filmed later on sound stages at Warner Brothers. The mm. film was shot entirely in Savannah, Georgia, end quote. I will say it also features one of Jude Law's earliest film appearances. And on the tour, they did take us into the room where the crime is purported to have been committed. Oh, interesting. They, they would not let you take pictures. Yeah. So another interesting thing to note and featured in the article I mentioned above is that Jack ended up in a copyright dispute with Warner Brothers. You and I have been talking a lot about copyright disputes yeah, this have. year. So I'm going to put it very quickly in my own understanding. After failing to negotiate the use of Jack's image, the movie simply used a nearly an identical image to Jack's and Jack felt that's copyright infringement. You know, his picture has made this book famous and made the film you know, people wanted to see the film. So they wanted to use his bird girl statue for the, for the front of the, like the DVD or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. And I guess they couldn't come to an agreement. So they just made their own, their but own Jack version. says their own version but of with, with a copy. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's exactly like his, according to Jack. So the courts decided that while the scenes in the film that used the replicated statue of the bird girl, which was licensed by her daughter, the woman who sculpted it, she did give them a copy as long as they returned it to her. So that was used in the film. Those were not infringement, but the production stills were infringement. And Warner Brothers settled out of court with Jack for a tidy seven figure sum. Wow. Yes. Both Jack and Alice, the daughter of the person who originally sculpted the bird girl, have tried while Jack was alive. I don't know if Alice still is. Tried to keep copyright infringement at bay within Savannah. So many illegal reproductions have been made of both the photo and the sculpture that, that mm. Alice, the daughter, finally had to just relent and allow some, quote, properly licensed reproductions to be sold. And I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what Jack ended up doing with his images because he did pass away. So that's what that was. Can you imagine, though, this famous photo, this famous 
statue and people are just ripping it off to, for keychains mm-hmm. and towels and all that kind of stuff. And while we were in Savannah, we did see a store that was like the bird girl store. So I'm going to oh, guess wow. that, or the historical area. It was something like that. It had tons of bird girl statues. I'm going to guess that maybe that was the official one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Finally, this is the one I think you may have been mixing up with Johnny Mercer. Maybe the bench at Conrad Aiken's grave is where the characters yes. have drinks at night. Yes. So is that in the book or is that in the movie? That was the app. Oh, okay. I don't know if the characters, if they mean the characters in the book or the characters in the movie, but somebody had drinks at Conrad Aiken's grave. So Conrad Aiken is is pretty awesome in his own his own right. Poets.org says, quote, Conrad Potter Aiken was born in Savannah, Georgia on August 5th, 1889. He was a small boy. His father killed his mother and committed mm. suicide himself, a tragedy mm. that had a profound impact on Aiken's development. He was mm. raised by a great great aunt in Massachusetts and graduated from Harvard in 1912 during the same period as T.S. Eliot and E.E. E. Cummings. Wikipedia then goes on to elaborate that Conrad was, quote, an American writer and poet honored with the Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award and was United States Poet Laureate from 1950 to 52. His published mm-hmm. works include poetry, short stories, novels, literary criticism, a play, and an autobiography. So to put it briefly, he is someone who is worthy of a visit even without a connection to the book or the film. Yeah. And that is the end of my Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil just kind of follow the path of all the people involved in that yeah very much so that was Mm -hmm. interesting armchair psychologist this has been a longer episode so in terms of our armchair i I don't know that we should do a whole segment but just maybe just a comment or two Mm -hmm. about our experience of Mm -hmm. of visiting these grave sites one thing i will say i think found this fascinating Kirk went with me because I needed you know somebody uh-huh. to take the pictures and, right right and and he he found it really interesting too and when you finished just now and we were talking about all the different stories in Bonaventure I remember visiting Conrad Aiken's site it's just so much history mm-hmm. so much beauty it is fascinating so I understand I understand people who visit grave sites you know mm-hmm. I think I I totally get it yeah it was probably one of my favorite experiences of our our trip down there because and i i kind of even liked that we didn't have the app because we just kind of we worked together we some of it we actually found based upon um the photograph that i found online and we looked around until we met that's the 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 cemetery plot that i'm not sharing that's how we ended up finding it is we looked at okay in the background of what someone else posted here's what it looked like so we were looking we knew the letter that this was in and we just drove around until we found what resembled what was in this photograph so it was really like this scavenger hunt and we were there about two hours just yeah. driving around and finding all these places and I enjoyed it I don't know how I feel about the whole taking your picture with the people because again my respectful face is not it's silly but I don't know I don't know I don't know I feel like you should go and then look at these people look up these people later and learn about them because you know the Chapman Mr. Neal these people were amazing and we had no idea who they were Mm -hmm. yeah you're teasing out that fine line between reverence yeah and and respect versus if it's meaningful to you sometimes you want to capture that Mm -hmm. so you know so the photo may not be a sensational thing as much as it may be I want to remember this yes or this is this is a special place there's history here or this is a person I admired yeah I want to I want to have a keepsake from this right and I guess that where I'm landing I I agree with you there but my thinking is like how do you how do you pose is it okay to smile is it okay to (laughs) cheese you know I I don't know that's where I'm it's tricky I I don't have an answer for that either I'm very glad you came up with this idea I think it's been fascinating. I, I loved hearing the place, you know, hearing all about the places you visited and those fascinating people. And mm-hmm. and to me, that's how we we end. I mean, I'm coming away from this experience with respect yeah. and admiration for people that I didn't know much, yes. if anything, about before. Right. So a happy Halloween to our listeners, but a big old cheers to these people who've gone before us and who've just achieved so much and made such a difference. Cheers to them. Cheers. This episode of Scandal Water was executive produced by Candy Thomas, that's me, 
and Ashley Raymer Brown. That's me. It was researched and written by Candy Thomas and edited by Ashley Raymer Brown. All music was written, composed, performed, and mixed by Josh Martin. The artwork was designed by Matt C. Adams, while our website was developed by Joshua Reith. If you like what you hear and you want to help keep the Scandal Water brewing, please go to our website, scandalwaterpodcast.com. Just click on your podcatcher of choice, then hit follow to subscribe. And while you're there, you might as well leave us a five-star rating and review. And don't forget, it's always more fun when you share your tea with others. As a reminder, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes. The thoughts and opinions of the host during each episode of Scandal Water are their own and do not reflect the opinions of any future guests, advertisers, or clearly professional psychologists. Thanks for listening.